Um, thank you all for tuning in and thank you to our guest speaker, Professor Pamela Webster, for giving us her time and this opportunity to learn. Uh, first, some housekeeping. The event will be recorded and we'll ask everyone to keep cameras and microphones turned off because this can hamper the connection sometimes if we have a lot of traffic. And also we will have time for some Q&A at the end. Um, please submit questions into the chat and we will monitor it throughout the lecture and moderate then at the end. Now for those, if I can just flip through slides. Uh, for those joining who are not aware, the Students for Global Health is a student network and registered charity whose mission is uh, tackling global and local health inequalities through education, advocacy and community action. Now, our Cambridge branch is part of an international network of over 1.5 million students. We have six subcommittees, each with a different focus and who run a lot of events that may be of interest to you. So please connect to our social channels, our website, Facebook, Twitter, and so on. For instance, our lecture series team have organized talks that run weekly until the end of March or mid-March, and you'll have seen this on the uh, sign up for this event. Our CAMHU team will run a simulation of the World Health Organization Assembly in August. Those wishing to take part can take on the role of delegates of countries and other stakeholders and debate uh, potential WHO policies and where attention and resources are needed and so on. The theme for this year for the uh, simulation is health and the environment, which I am sure everyone here is interested in, so please sign up on the website camhu.org. And in line with our theme, health and the environment, I will now pass you over to Professor Webster, a longtime public health educator, consultant to the WHO Healthy Cities Project, awarded an MBE for services to public health, to name but a few aspects of a very extensive CV. Um, Professor Webster, you can now share your screen when ready. Uh, the floor, so to speak, is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Being a, quite a left-wing socialist, the MBE always sort of makes me wince sometimes. But then my son told me, uh, you're not a Benjamin Zephaniah. If you say no, nobody's going to know. <laughs> so you might as well take it and have a party. So there we go. Um, so can you see my screen? Uh, we can see you, but we haven't seen any, we don't see any slides yet. Oh, that's funny. Sorry. Here we go. Can you see that now? No, not yet. Sorry about this, when we tried it before it all worked, didn't it? It, it took a moment, so maybe. Okay. So let me see. Any luck now? No, not yet. <laughs> well, it's always the case, isn't it? So, it works in practice. It seems to be standard with Zoom. Okay, let me just go back. Here we are. Okay, now we can see the slides. Oh, good. Good, thanks. Right, so thanks for inviting me. Um, so your overarching theme is urban environment and health. And so what I'm going to be um, hopefully saying something on today is um, reimagining health in the cities. So, so I'm going to divide it into 
different sections. So the first one is I'll set the context and look at the concepts of urbanization and urban city. And then I'll briefly summarize the impact of urbanization on health and inequalities. And then I'll outline the history of the WHO Healthy Cities Movement and then look at a possible way forward for a transition to healthy and sustainable cities. So as you can see in the last 50 years, uh, sorry, the, uh, from 1950 to 2050, 1950 the world was mainly rural and by 2050 it's expected that over two thirds of people will be living in cities. So globally, more than 4 billion people are living in urban areas and the UN decided or sort of estimated that it was in 2007 was the first time when there were more people living in the sit in cities rather than in rural areas and as i was saying by 2050 it's expected two thirds two thirds of the population that is seven billion people will be living in urban areas and here's um, a graph to show what's happening in the last 500 years. You, as you can see, the exponential rise in urban in the urban population. So, just to hammer home the point, in 1900, the beginning of the last century, uh, there was only one in ten people lived in the city. By the middle of that century, there were three in ten. And by the end of the 20th century, more than half of the world's population were city dwellers. And in some, some of the cities, the population exceeds those of entire countries. So let's look now at the concept of what we mean by urbanization and urbanicity. What do you understand by urbanization? If you put the word Google, um, urbanized, Urban, urbanization into Google images. These are the various things that you will come up with. And there's all different definitions that were used, that are used. One is, as you can read, increase in proportion or percentage of a population which lives in towns or cities. Look at the mesh term. It's a process by which society changes from rural to an urban way of life, but it also refers to gradual increase in the proportion of people living in urban areas, um, sometimes called internal migration. You go and look at Wikipedia, it says very honestly that it varies between countries and between numbers, and the UN has uh, what uh, it's its definition is the movement of people from rural to urban areas. So as you can see, it's, it's, it seems a bit difficult to define urbanization. And there's been a range of definitions that have been put forward by different researchers when you're looking at research papers. And they usually tell you what they have looked at as what they have thought of as urbanization. But the most commonly used one <coughs> sorry, conceptualizes urbanization as change in size, density, and the heterogeneity of cities. So uh, urbanization is mainly related to city size, and it doesn't sort of get the social and economic dominance of what happens in a city. So in 76, this thesis decided to fill this gap with bringing in the term urbanicity. What is, what is the concept? What is the concept of urbanicity? It's about the impact of living in, a, in, in urban areas at a particular point in time. And it was borne out that urban areas are, urban areas are constantly changing and that can affect uh, what's happening in the city and it's both the process of change and the condition of what they're living in at that time. So uh, 
this chap who's the editor of the um, Journal of Urban Health, he described it as a state of urbanness resulting from urbanization. So what we mean by this? I want to illustrate this by a piece of work we did a while ago, which was published in the World Health Bulletin, and I'll follow this up by in the next part as well. So what we did was we, there is a, a, a urban, urbanicity scale, but we took that and we adapted it and had these seven elements of what is, um, and, uh, and each element had different subgroups, which had different points. And we used that to look at urbanicity and our date, and we've did the, uh, got the data from the Indian census, which was collected in 2001 and collated in 2008. Like I said, this is a piece of work we did a while ago. This is the setting. It's in the south of India. It's uh, Madras or Chennai, uh, as it's now called, where the test match you lot won today, which was... Um, uh, so we won't go into that. Anyway, the urban area arm of this is central China sorry central chennai and then the rural arm of it was the seven villages and these were the different villages so this was how we did the scale as you can see population size went from sort of uh, to 500 right up, which had one point right up to 20, uh, 20 000, which gave it 10 points and then the density again and then when we looked at access uh, to markets uh, so that was whether they had a cinema and you know as you can see the different ones on the screen and then communications did they have a post office uh, did they have a telegraph office at that time which they still had um, and uh, sort of you know then if you look to transports it was just uh, it was it a mud, mud, mud road or was it even worse than that and we gave them points for all that and then educational facilities and finally health whether they had a primary care center or a hospital so these were the points given to these places and then we quantified urbanicity of each location and grouped them into low medium and high uh, scores and the cutoff because there was uh, the maximum was 70 and the cutoffs were as you can see there and they were obviously ordered categorical variables. So this slide shows you the size uh, and the points that they got, and then therefore whether they were low, medium, or high on the scale. Now this very bright registrar of us who was helping with this, who was part of this research group, who's now obviously uh, a renowned epidemiologist uh, working at Oxford had this bright idea of going to each of these places, going to the center of each place and uh, of the difference uh, sort of low, middle and high uh, score places, stand right in the middle of that particular place and take photos. So visually you can see that uh, the one with the low score, that is a photo, uh, photo from the middle of a village with a low score. This one with the median score of 37. And here is the one with the Chennai Metropolitan Cooperation, which had a high score of 68. So I hope this sort of gives you a feel for what we mean by urbanicity and what we mean by uh, uh, urbanization. Urbanization refers to change in size, density, and heterogeneity, whereas urbanicity refers to the impact of living in that area at a given point in time. And both urbanization and urbanicity are complementary and both affect health. So let's look at the impact of urbanization on health and inequalities next. So, from sort of early on, and as you saw from time immemorial, there's been cities have been slowly growing, 
and this is Milton from the 17th century, as one who long in populous city pent, where houses thick and sewers annoy the air. And these are pictures of this is uh, London, a poor street in London, and then there's Percy Bysshe Shelley. Hell is much like London, a populous and smoky city. And that is the famous uh, Gin Lane, Hogarth's Gin Lane. So, from, as I said, from time immemorial, health considerations have always been a part of urban development. So, and the characteristics are you have dense crowding of humans and everything else. You had the rats and the fleas, which resulted in the Black Death in the 14th century, and more recently, SARS and and where we are now in the midst of COVID. There was also because cities were areas where people would came into trade and there was a lot of mobility of people coming and going. And, and so for the first time in medieval Venice, uh, uh, there was a first state of uh, state-led public health measures, which was the quarantine, which we all now are very familiar with, was introduced. There was also the opportunity to enjoy and exploit human diversity, uh, both social relation, human and social relationships, education, cultural development. People came from other places, learned from cultures. Um, there was an exchange of ideas and cultures. And even if you look at it now, if you look at, I mean, if you take, for example, uh, people who come from villages in India and come into the urban come and settle in urban areas. Um, after some time, their children get educated more. The girls are not stopped from going to school after a particular age. They're allowed to go to work sometime, you know, so the, the cultural aspects are better. They have more education. So there's all these uh, things as well. So if you go back to the study, this is to, just show you uh, some evidence that urbanization does impact on health. So as we, sh as I showed you before, we measured urbanicity uh, scores. Then we looked at the risk factors for uh, NCD surveillance. And this was from a larger WHO study that was done. And then we looked at the relationship between urbanicity and the number of risk factors in, in the in the area that we studied. So this was the study set in, uh, set in, a, in a bigger one and here's, in, and here's Chennai and there's that the bit where we are. Uh, our, our part, so we had participants from 155 wards in the Chennai municipality which was the main urban centre and they were randomly uh, chosen. And we had a sa urban sample of 2,500 participants. And then the rural component where the villages are round, which was sort of, you know, like suburbs, but a bit, yeah. Um, and so we had a random sample of 2,500 from there. And the ages were between 15 to 64 at the time of the study in the, and they had, were in the house. And the data collection was through the WHO validated steps question. And what we looked at were um, the risk factors for tobacco use, unhealthy diet, vegetable consumption, physical inactivity, overweight, so BMI, and blood pressure, which was taken. And they also you know, did the height, weight, and blood pressure for each participant. So, uh, the, uh, so this is the sort of summary table of the crude odds ratio and uh, for males for all these risk factors and for females. And in summary, if you look at the summary table, you can see that as urbanicity score increased, so going from low to high, the risk factors also increased. And you'll notice that vegetable uh, fresh fruit and vegetable consumption is not there. That's because there were only two people who said that they did have fresh fruit and vegetable. Um, 
and uh, and so that that was missing. It was also interesting that um, you would think that in the in the rural areas they would have more fresh fruit and vegetable, but actually the access to fresh fruit and vegetable was more in the urban areas than it was in the rural areas because the rural areas mainly grew paddy um, and not that many fruit or vegetables because of the type of weather and the land there. So why do people move and why is this everybody wanting to go to the cities? Um, so as countries get richer and as popula populations urbanize, so urban populations they supposedly have higher living standards but also agricultural employment falls within urban, uh, with urbanization i don't know how many of you saw the rather heart-rending scenes when covid came on and prime minister modi decided overnight to insist that all the uh, um, immigrant workers that, uh, who came from the rural areas to go home and all of them were walking back miles and miles. Now these people had left their homes but their main, a lot of them were subsistent farmers in their little lands there and came and lived on the pavements of Delhi in a lot of places to you know so, um, so agriculture wasn't happening uh, at least with the small subsistence farmers. We have a look at this later. So most cities are growing very quickly. Um, and by 2050, uh, the, the majority of the growth is projected in low income countries in Africa and in Asia. And as we saw, though urban living offers a lot of benefits, including job opportunities, which is why they come, possibly higher incomes, setting up businesses. Um, it's, there's also a lot of challenges. So if you, if you look at across the globe, urban populations tend to have higher living standards. In nearly all the countries, they have better access to electricity, um, in urban rather than in rural areas, improved sanitation, improved drinking water, clear, uh, clean fuels for cooking, because that's one of the big issues in, ru in rural areas with uh, the, you know, the cooking fuels causing a lot of uh, lung issues and deaths. Um, and child malnutrition is lower in urban areas. So, but, when you look at urbanization, there's when you look, there's a strong correlation with income, and uh, such. So this doesn't simply show these relationships. They just may simply show the effects of higher incomes on electricity access, sanitation, nutrition, drinking water, etc. But as we know and we've seen there are significant inequalities within urban areas itself. And this you can see from across the board and mainly in low and middle income countries, a large proportion of the urban population live in uh, slum households, um, which, you know, which means they have hardly any access to basic resources. And just under one in three of the population uh, in urban areas globally live in uh, slum households. And what do we mean by slum household? Th this is what the um, UN habitat definition is. People living under the same roof in an urban area and who lack one or more of the following, which is, you know, basic sanitation, water, the things that we've been talking of. So as we know, as we inequalities exist in all urban areas and it could be inequalities because of housing provision access to services access to open land safety security um, the number of urban poor is on the increase everywhere 
more and more people are living in insecure and rented accommodation. We saw that recently during the COVID uh, time when people didn't have jobs, couldn't pay for their, their rents and the uh, interventions that have been brought in for that. I volunteer with a homeless charity in Oxford and sadly a lot a, a fair proportion especially of the older men who are 50 and over are homeless because they cannot afford their rents they cannot pay their rent and became homeless and then once they're homeless then it becomes a vicious cycle of being able to get a job keep a job and then of course there's obvious issues around alcohol and drugs as well um, so a number of these people are without basic facilities and of course poor air quality as uh, um, every time in delhi uh, the smog uh, people living on the streets the rich are okay they sit in their homes with these filters or they go away to the countryside but the poor have to stay there and have serious effects health risks we don't have to go too far to look at this the inequalities. This is, as you know, the Grenfell Tower at Kensington. And if you then look at the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, um, where the Kensington Palace is, you can see where Grenfell Tower is and where is the most deprived. And just within that area, you can see the inequalities. So, Urbanization causes problems with health. It also causes increases inequalities and has an impact on inequalities. So let's move to the next bit and I'll tell you briefly, let me keep an eye on the time, yeah, the, about the history and evolution of the WHO Healthy Cities Movement. I was quite fortunate when I was a senior registrar, as we were called in those days, to have the opportunity to be seconded to the WHO Healthy Cities uh, at uh, in Copenhagen where I was there for a year and then continued being there and um, so eventually I was expert advisor on healthy cities indicators and profiles so I've had a long history um, of the with the WHO Healthy Cities movement so what happened originally was there were early academic writings on the determinants of health, and this was the healthy field concept, which was postulated by Henrik Blum. This was in 74. So that influenced uh, the Lalonde report from Canada and government initiatives, which recognized the broader determinants of health. So this in turn influenced a US uh, uh, American psychiatrist who had edited a book in 1963 called The Urban Condition, People Policy in the Metropolis. And he was one of the first to recognize the interplay of the range of determinants on health in the urban, uh, uh, at the urban level. So in 1984, when they had uh, an anniversary celebration of the Lalonde Report, he and his and a Canadian colleague Trevor Hancock proposed this concept of how it would be possible to create what is called a healthy city in inverted commas. So, inspired by this, Ilona Kickbush, who was then uh, the regional officer for health promotion at the WHO Copenhagen office, I wasn't there at that time. I went there about five years later, um, and so. Uh, her, she um, thought this would be a very interesting concept, this healthy cities concept. And she saw this as an, a way to take the notions of health promotion and apply them locally um, at a, uh, you know, con and concretely. At that time, they thought, oh, we might have about eight cities who may be interested and, you know, we'll see how it works. But now, of course, it's established as a long-term international development. So that's a brief overview of the, of the evolution of the Healthy Cities movement. So how, how can we take this forward? We know there are issues uh, with 
uh, with urban environments. They have a major impact on health and on inequalities. Um, so what can we do and how can we, are there ways to take uh, for a transition to sister healthy and sustainable cities? And how can we reimagine health in the cities? Of course, SDGs, everybody wants to know how it interacts or interacts with SDGs. If you look, there's a whole range of goals which talk about uh, urban development from, you know, so several goals and uh, can be slotted into urban development. But sadly, the speed at which this urbanization happened, because interestingly enough, when cities first started out in ancient Mesopotamia, the, uh, the, city, the urban planners had left very careful notes on uh, how food should be stored careful, uh, safely, what about water supply, how sewage disposal should be should happen and sadly along the years all this just fell by the wayside and then we landed up with the cesspool of what was uh, cities uh, as we saw in medieval Europe and England as well when we saw some of those uh, pictures previously. So this this quotation is from uh, one of the UN officers who was working in Kobe as part of the healthy um, urban health for WHO, and so he said, "Everything has happened so fast, but uh, you know, how can we how can we do this? How can we make things better in the cities?" and he came up with these five challenges and he said these are the five challenges what can cities do to meet these challenges so one was you know promoting urban planning for healthy behaviors and safety improve the conditions for adequate shelter and sanitation communities being involved in their local decision making and have accessible and age-friendly cities and also make uh, you know make them resilient to emergencies and disasters. We can learn some lessons from risk factor intervention studies, uh, which happened in uh, known in middle income countries, and they suggest some of the ways this can happen is it it has to have you can't sort of have the hospitals and therefore they get ill and then we sort them out. It's got to be broader than that as we know, we've got to start uh, up, we have to make sure prevention is there as well. And for that to, ha uh, that to happen, it's got to be integrated and you have to have broad intersectoral action. You have to have the community participate, participating. You also have to have legislation and NGOs, appropriate NGOs, and health services have to make changes to manage both those at high risk, but also educating those before they become higher risk and promote public education. So, um, as we've seen, cities have enormous potential uh, to, uh, to become health generating places, but uh, there have been considerable challenges as well. So um, this study, this, this was a case study done by the King's Fund, who explored the role of cities in improving populations, population health, and what were the conditions that were needed for success. And this was based on 50 interviews with leaders for 14 cities. And was, there was also an extended case study on London. So what they found was while there were wide variations between the different cities and the governance and the powers and the resources, there were some common themes running through them all. And the first one was that it depended on coordinated action, which is what we saw before as well, things that happen, things that work at different levels. So, and 
you know, so housing, employment, all of them have to come together and there has to be a multi-sectoral involvement and coordination. But also it was very essential to have a very good leadership and elected mayors uh, and or other leaders uh, have very, uh, not just formal responsibilities, but also powers to make this happen. We saw some of this in, in the mayors during the COVID who were uh, trying to get things for their cities before they were closed. So we saw some of that role uh, and in that influence that they're talking about in this. So what do you mean, what do I mean by a healthy city? Essentially, it's not, it does not depend on how healthy the city is in terms of its health uh, or its current infrastructure, but rather a commitment to improve the city's uh, willingness to, you know, uh, to, to improve the city and its health uh, and its connection all politically, economically and in the social arena. Uh, so it would be, it would aim to be a health supportive environment to achieve a good quality of life, basic sanitation, hygiene and access to health care. So as I said in the beginning, the, originally the Healthy Cities project started off to translate the principles of Health for All Action into practice, both at local level in the urban settings. And it focused on the community as large, both strengths and, and the problems, rather than saying working in silos saying, oh, we'll take tobacco, we'll take cancer. It was across the board. And it was one of the main things, the vision of this, the healthy city was, it had to secure political commitment because they realized that unless we get the buy-in from the politicians, th um, things won't change or uh, and things may not go forward. Whereas getting in a political commitment would help things a great deal. And they were also taking innovative steps um, bringing people together, getting politicians involved, and have, bringing uh, together organizational and institutional changes. And there are lots of examples and case studies, uh, if you go and look at the Healthy Cities projects, right across the globe and several in the European region as well. So why is their approach different? So, and what is their approach? So their approach basically is getting coalition of local governments and communities and then to address the priority problems which are related to urban health and environment. So one of the main differences between say the, um, the tobacco people and the WHO, the maternal and child health, the, the main difference between the Healthy Cities project is that it's this it's the cent it has the central lo ro local government at its as its center and has um, it, it's the local government which is at the center of this so how does it work the first routinely available data is collected and one of the things we started doing in the beginning was it wasn't just about mortality and morbidity because you know, uh, that wasn't going to give you what was happening with the city, where were the issues with the city. It was much broader than that. It was socioeconomic conditions, lifestyle. And when we first started, uh, that was quite difficult for the cities to grasp. And then with their help and um, with a lot of, uh, um, sort of workshops and bringing different people in from the grassroots as well as epidemiologists and others, we developed a set of uh, indicators um, which encompass lifestyle, environmental conditions, you know, all the factors influencing health, including what was happening in the local, um, local government. 
then that information was analyzed to provide an evidence base. So, so where could where the possible areas of action and where were the relative priorities? And that was in the form of a healthy city health profile format. And it was important that those indicators were collected, they were turned into a city health profile. And then from that was developed a city health plan, which was then, here's the evidence, these are the things that need to be done. And what are the priorities for us to do that? And, and so it was collecting the data, analyzing it to provide the evidence and using it to inform health policy. And then, and, and then that could also be used to monitor the impact of interventions by analyzing trends. So this model is useful because it measures health status in cities using available data, doing a meaningful analysis, and also uh, providing evidence base to the policymakers, to the politicians, so they can set priorities where it's needed, not where they had the, the people lobbying the most or where they felt would get them the votes. So um, city governments and policymakers have to plan uh, because it's not, we're in 2021 already, we've seen with COVID the impacts, things, uh, you know, uh, uh, what's happening with densely populated areas, with inequalities. So, um, and by 2050, two thirds of our populations will be living in cities. So they have to plan uh, and manage the impacts of urbanization on poverty, inequality, you know, everything that we've spoken of so far, a whole range of things. And only by addressing these in an interconnected way, uh, both technical and political barriers have to change can we ensure good quality of life for millions of urban dwellers otherwise? Uh, inequalities are going to get worse and health and its impact on health, it will also become worse. So the strategies should consider to sum up the underlying influences on inequality, health inequalities, and also on education, income distribution, housing, you know, all the social networks, everything that we've been, you know, all the various aspects that impact and cause inequalities. It's also important that strategies are aimed at reducing not just overall population risk, but at the same time also reducing gaps in the different, uh, between different population groups. So not forgetting um, the different groups, the homeless people or the ethnic minority group or the refugee population. Um, and in a, lot, in, in a lot of instances, this will have to be a redesign, but not just a redesign, but also an evaluation of the interventions. Um, and, and that would be sort of identifying and paying special in, and also having to identify and pay special uh, attention to particular groups like new urban migrants and women and other groups. This was a photo I took a few years ago because one of my roles is I'm um, adjunct professor of global health at Chinese University of Hong Kong. So we went to do some projects then we were in Beijing um, and Hong Kong and then we went to we were taken to see some of the projects in the rural areas so this was uh, rural China and we went to the schools there and all the kids came on their bicycles um, all neatly parked on the side sadly a lot of their parents were going off to the city to work to bring um, and and therefore um, a lot of them were with the grandparents and this was the China, uh, I didn't take the, uh, the original one, but uh, it, uh, I did the other one. Um, in Beijing, uh, it just shows soon, two thirds of the population will be living in areas like this. 
I just want to finish with a quote from one of my previous DFL students. He's called Sri Krishna and he was working on local government and, and health and how that impacts and what, how they could be encouraged. And what he had put in, his, in the front of his thesis was, urbanization for me is not a problem, it is an inevitable process. And there are some challenges inbuilt in that process. So we need to equip ourselves with sensible and feasible solutions to address those challenges and make the process more smoother and comfortable for everyone. These are just some few photos of urban art and, uh, and of course, how to keep it in an urban environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was um, very informative, very insightful. Um, we have a few questions in the chat, but I would like to ask the first one, if I may. Um, have there been, uh, okay, or can you tell us a bit about any, any uh, tangible results from, from the, the Healthy Cities project? Yes, there are s several and uh, different in different um, places, uh, which is why I said there's a lot of case studies in different places. But the one that immediately comes to mind is um, our sort of our leader at the Healthy Cities, a rather interesting, innovative. Um, um, person called Agnes Suros. So he went to visit one of the healthy cities because the way the healthy cities are, are done, the WHO is you have to apply to be a healthy city. You have to commit to do various things, which is including, you know, sort of having a healthy city project office, having a, uh, having a project officer, collecting data, you know, putting a profile together and then having political commitment, putting it into the local um, of, uh, and having the political commitment, the mayor involved. So it was, a, it's a whole process. And um, so he, so occasionally uh, go to uh, see what's happening and see what, what they're doing and stuff. So he went to um, one of the healthy cities in, in Poland and he was immediately taken off to this rather wonderful brand new cardiac unit which they were so proud of with interventions for you know oh look what we're doing we're doing all these interventional cardiology and next to that was a big poster advertising cigarettes um, and, and this was the start of their journey into being a healthy city soon they evolved and they learned what it was about and the next time we visited the city we weren't taken and they actually held the healthy city conference in their city it it was more about it was a, a it wasn't showing off their intervention their interventional cardiology units but more about what was happening how they'd stopped uh, they brought in uh restrictions for tobacco stop, you know no, no, no smoking areas. They were um, sort of lobbying the government to bring in uh, smoke-free areas. This was obviously, you know, sort of in the early 90s. Um, and so that was sort of just comes, uh, that's one of the things that comes. And there's several, several examples of these. Uh, but but it's, it's, a, it's quite a broad thing. And, um, uh, you know, it's about the commitment. And the mayors who were really involved. Uh, we had a mayor from Liverpool who was a, uh, who was a pharmacist and became a mayor at Liverpool, who was one of the most outstanding people. And Liverpool was one of the most outstanding healthy cities. And then, of course, governments changed, and you know, mayors changed, and then things all go back to where they used to be. Yeah. We have a, a few questions and comments from um, yeah. BJ. I think uh, if you would like to unmute yourself, you, you might be better at asking these questions than I am. There's quite a few points there. Yeah. 
thank you so uh, thank you very much for the talk ma'am so i had so i am working with department of women and child development in the government of maharashtra mm -hmm. so uh, i was very intrigued by your uh, you know slides and first question which came to my mind when we talk about under nutrition of children mm -hmm. and when we talk about comparison of rural and urban areas mm -hmm. when we see the nfhs data we see that almost now the urban under nutrition status if not worse is as bad as that of rural and when we sort of compare the absolute numbers and let's say density of undernourished children it is very high in urban areas so uh, i wanted your thoughts upon this and with nfhs 5 data coming out we see along with under nutrition childhood obesity is also an now a public health emergency so the uh, what public policy instruments would you suggest to you know tackle this dual burden of uh, under nutrition and the healthy cities project which you talked about how does it you know uh, sort of encompasses this thank you ma'am i totally agree so which is when and i said uh, it looks like urban areas children have better nutrition but then when you nuanced it there's a lot of inequalities and while there's access to food may be better but but there was also this great inequalities that was happening as well and therefore not not necessarily not necessarily uh if it was it, it, as you said it may be the same or even worse in urban areas uh, one of my dfil students did a very interesting uh, her thesis was on looking at enriga you know the the government policy where they give money uh, when you're uh, so for uh, daily laborers even at the time when they don't have any work the government give them a little bit of work and they're given money uh, so that uh, and even that small amount of money and even with and it was mainly the women who were who were sent to do this work um, even with that small amount of money and even with a lot of the money being taken back to their homes and given to their uh, to their in-laws and their uh, husbands in spite of all that the nutrition among we mainly one of the uh, outcomes we looked at was whether it helped had any impact on nutrition on on childhood nutrition malnutrition and it did even that small amount of money that was given but to these people who wouldn't if they didn't have a job would obviously not be making any money at all in the fallow periods did make a difference in increase in the um, in child childhood uh, malnutrition so there are various government policies uh, that government has been bringing in and um, obviously some work um, and some work better than the others but then also there were a lot of issues which we also looked at which not unsolvable like you know there was the middleman but i think now the government's putting it directly into their bank accounts so there are a whole load of policies and i uh, agree with you uh, definitely and then looking at the dual thing of yes that is another massive issue massive i wasn't being ironic there uh, with the with the dual burden of undernutrition and overnutrition and again this is about educating on the kind of food uh, people eat when you know the fresh fruits and vegetables i remember when i was a medical student it was almost centuries ago we had to we did our rural work in some of the villages in um, in in south india and they have these things called um in 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 tamil it's it's called a peanut ball uh, literally translated so it's basically peanuts with uh, jaggery which is an unrefined sugar which is a, quite a healthy snack that kids would have but what they then decided was what was much better was to go to the local corner shop where they would have bottles of glaxo biscuits sold singly full of sugar and they would be buying their children that because they thought it was nicer for children to have that than to have the more nutritious um you know uh, kadla mutai or the peanut candy a uh, peanut ball that we used to uh, th that normally they would have 
we also did some work here in 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 um, in uh, the Thames Valley, and we looked in Slough, and again we looked at under five um, uh, obesity in under five in the under fives, and we had we looked at Afro Caribbean children, um, South Asians, and white Caucasian children, and while it had increased, we had a, a ten year data on that while it had increased with everybody especially among south asians uh, it was three times more and there was a massive difference between uh, the the under five boys who were three times more obese than the under five girls and this was because they were being fed by what the parents thought they were giving them special food which was a lot of the junk food and the girls were getting the more healthy home food so it's about education it's about uh, and all these advertisements i get so angry every time i go home and see these ads where they're saying oh you know all this brain give your child complan give him this biscuit their brain grows they grow i mean that all that you know there's there should be governments uh, you know like they have here banning those sorts of things sugary foods that that sort of thing yeah, sorry, I don't know if that answered your question, but yeah. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Now I'm gonna combine two questions here from jo Johanna and from, um, from Anya. Uh, in your estimation and experience, how serious do governments and policymakers take urban health? Does it receive the attention it clearly deserves? And what would be the best way of successfully advocating for action on urban health? And Anya says, uh, I like your point about targeting specific population groups and uh, again I was wondering how challenging it is to engage governments with these sorts of projects. Yes, that's a good question. So politicians um, have a shot, basically they want to make sure they get elected the next time. So it's with, so they want quick, quick returns, quick goals see what's happening you know what can i do tomorrow if i if i you know uh, put a new road yeah, these people you know uh, will probably vote for me type thing but that's why i i was quite impressed with the way the healthy cities sort of idea worked because the politicians were the central characters in this whole project so they had to be there they had to be committed and involved and once they started understanding the process and understanding the multi-sectoral uh, sort of you know it's not just about building hospitals it's not just about putting a road in here so unless the hospital the the town planners and the politicians and others got together and said oh we we, we have to have a health impact assessment of this or we can't have the this road here and everybody suddenly realized that they were not sitting in their little offices doing their little things and you know they had a part to play in health and that seemed quite empowering to them of course um the the politicians who got involved were probably the politicians who 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 had let's say better agendas but they they did start to, i think that's why this particular healthy cities project idea gets them involved and therefore they start to see what's happening the other the other thing way to uh, involve politicians which is what we found was that uh, you know you collected the indicators you made it into a profile and then you took it to them and had this big media thing about you know here's what's happening in your city the, these are the main issues these are the priority issues and then you get uh, you know and it's, there's a big media launch and then you provide them with the evidence and say here are things that could work and then if something has worked here's how it has worked and then they're always hungry for that kind of thing i think it's also i suppose in some ways electing the right people but then also the right people wanting to, you know politicians should be about wanting to improve health and 
I, yeah, so it, it's a mixture of things. It's complex, but I, it has been the ones I've seen who were involved within the program and the project were really very, very good. And especially several of the Scandinavian ones were absolutely brilliant. And then uh, about engaging um, subgroups. Um, it, it's, it's, first of all, it's important that we know they are there and they know we, we're there and we want to know about them and find out the issues. Because one of the things we did um, in one particular city was that they had a separate profile done for the refugee population of that city. So, so while they um, got, took the indicators and got the data on the city as a whole, each year they decided this year, this would be the special subgroup that we would collect more in-depth data on. We were going to have a, a, you know, more meetings with them, have more qualitative work done. And each, each five years, not each year, each five years, they decided that they would um, have an in-depth profile, in-depth thing into different subgroups. And then the, they got, obviously the group was uh, involved and then the priorities were set for that group and plans were made and then they were monitored further. I think I'm on, I, that was the two ones, wasn't it? That was the two, yeah. yeah. Um, we're just after 8 p.m. now, but I might yeah. One more question if that would be okay? Yeah, that's fine. And um, this one is from um, Anjali or Angli, I apologize if I pronounce your name wrong. It's, it says, thank you for a fascinating talk. What are your thoughts on the new trend in Western cities of young remote working individuals moving out of cities and back into rural areas? Do you think this will have a positive or negative long-term impacts on the health of cities? Um. It's, it's going to be an interesting journey we're going to be on. Um, it's, I don't think everybody can, I mean, there's still going to be huge numbers of people. Not everybody can move rural, uh, to rural places. People still have to live in cities. Home working has been very interesting. Uh, I've been working now with the COVID stuff and working remotely, looking at sort of, um, you know, sort of specialist areas like schools and care homes and, you know, prisons and things like that. And it is very intense working from home and you can't go to the kitchen, have a cup of coffee and have, you know, and, and there's all that interaction as well, that social interaction as well. And it's, it's, of course, it's better for the environment, but also there, there are lots of pros and cons. There, there is going to be, I think it's about thinking through what, um, what is going to help the city, what, but also make it sustainable and what's going to, so some things I think will not happen some things will have to close uh, but then you know what and some of the jobs it, so all this has to be thought through uh, to and and you know when i put up that thing about the sustainable um, development goals and the things that we could do to make cities more sustainable it should be more about sustainable healthy cities and um, I can't see a complete exodus to the country because first of all, it's not just not feasible, but also it's not, uh, not everybody can work remotely, but also not everybody can afford to do that. I don't know if it's answered the question, but these are my thoughts anyway. Thank you very much. Um, we're very grateful that you give us your time. Uh, there were a few more questions in, in the chat. I'm just going to say to those people that this uh, is recorded and it will be online on the Students for Global Health website. And I noticed throughout the talk that there are links to studies and you might find more information uh, to answer your questions there. Um, yes, thank you very much.
if people want, I mean, yeah, uh, once they go on those websites, that takes them into further areas and studies and things like that. Yeah. And I should have put a, a, a whole lot of references as well, but I could send that to you later if you want to. Yeah. yeah that would be Thank great. you very much. Thanks for having me. And I hope that was useful. Thank you very much. And good night to everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night.